Elizabeth Emma Breck is described as spiritual, outgoing, and very involved in the Buddhist community. She was a teacher at the Tucson High School and had two adult daughters. When she was 46 years old, she was seeing a psychiatrist for PTSD related to being sexually assaulted. She was advised by her psychiatrist to check into the Sierra Tucson Behavioral Health Center in Saddlebrook, Arizona. The 160-acre behavioral health facility has a reputation of being rehabbed to the stars, and on January 10, 2019, she checked in and planned to complete a 30-day program. That evening, she called her daughter to let her know of her plans. The intake staff determined Elizabeth was not a threat to herself or others and was released at 9 a.m. Sunday to move into the residential unit for the remainder of her stay. The residential unit, or the general living quarters, is an area that is not on lockdown. She was last seen at 3 p.m., and at some point later in the afternoon, she went missing. Her tracking bracelet, car keys, and personal belongings were found in her assigned room, and the tracking bracelet had been destroyed. She left her car at the hospital and is believed to have taken only her driver's license and some cash with her when she disappeared, but left her cell phone behind. It was 30 degrees that night, and she would not have survived long without shelter. The next month, her brother filed complaints against Sierra Tucson with the Arizona Department of Health Services and the Joint Commission alleging negligence. Her family alleges the facility didn't share information with them or the private investigator they hired to find her. There was no electronic surveillance to ensure patient safety, and Elizabeth wasn't provided with a phone to call her parents, who live outside the U.S. The rehab facility reportedly told local investigators that Elizabeth left the building on her own volition and was not in crisis at the time of her disappearance. However, her parents believed she was having a mental breakdown, and that played a role in her disappearance from the facility. Her family also says she loved Catalina State Park, and they believe she may have tried to walk there on foot from the facility. Sierra Tucson has faced many previous state investigations. Arizona DHS records indicate a pattern of fines against the facility spanning back years before Elizabeth went there for treatment. In 2019, just four months after Elizabeth was last seen, the family of 20-year-old Stephen Joe was awarded a $5 million settlement for his wrongful death in 2014. Stephen was in treatment for drug rehab and mental health issues and died from a fatal overdose only six days after checking in. The lawsuit accused Sierra Tucson of medical negligence for, among other things, not following up on Joe's suicidal thoughts he had been expressing during intake and not providing the needed supervision or follow-up. Since 2014, three other patients have also been found dead at Sierra Tucson. One was a retired medical doctor whose body was found two weeks after he disappeared in bushes located on the facility's property, but it was too decomposed to determine the cause of death. The state also gave Sierra Tucson six citations in 2016 for failing to protect the health and safety of patients and follow facility policy. The assistant director stated that the facilities do a comprehensive assessment of a patient's needs and risks during intake, but they are not required to have video surveillance. He also said unless patients are court-ordered to be there, they're legally allowed to walk out the front door. Elizabeth's family says that she's close with them and her two daughters, and it is very out of character for her to vanish, and they fear that foul play might be involved. As of today, Elizabeth has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Harachika Miyagi was born June 13, 1981, was Japanese descent, and went by the name Chika and Haru. He graduated from Lehigh High School in Utah and then from Utah Valley University. He wanted to make something of himself and started trying to build a business through social media and by producing videos on YouTube. On his channel, he would discuss a multitude of things, but primarily he would make videos regarding the trading software called Magic Stick that he created. He even created his own company called Tensai Financial Group, which he described as a Forex educational firm. He was the only employee the company had, and strangely, the address for the company doesn't even exist. At the age of 34, he lived in American Forks, Utah, and in 2015, things took a strange turn. 
On December 2nd and 3rd of 2015, he posted multiple posts with very strange and vague statements with little to no comments. Just before 9 p.m. on December 3rd, 2015, Haru would post the following words to his public Facebook account. The power of giving is important. Want to give as much as possible. It's called karma. For the next two days, his usually busy activity online went silent. Then on December 5th, he showed up 565 miles south of his home in the small town of Dewey, Arizona at a very remote, large horse ranch known as Med Bar Ranch. At 5 p.m., he opened the main gate to the property and proceeded up the dirt driveway to the house. A woman stepped outside to see who had pulled up to her home down a long private driveway in a red 2002 Mazda Protégé. He got out of the car and asked her if he could stay on her property or at her home for the evening, and she quickly told him no and suggested that he should try hotels in Prescott a half hour away. The woman then states that he calmly walked to his vehicle and got back inside. Instead of turning his car around and heading back the same way he came in, he proceeded north on the property and crashed through the closed gate before disappearing from her view. The woman then contacted the sheriff's office to report a trespasser, and when they arrived to take her statement, they investigated the area. The woman pointed out the broken gate and the direction in which the man was headed. Around two hours later, at 7 p.m., about one mile around the bend from the ranch, they found Haru's car. The Mazda was in Yarber Wash. The hood was wedged between the stony wash and barbed wire fencing. The vehicle was stuck and heavily damaged in the front and was towed away. Four days later, search dogs covered the area where the Mazda was found, but they picked up no scent or trace of Haru. Haru's cell phone was last traced somewhere shortly after he drove away from the ranch, and he has never been seen again. There are two different routes he could have taken to reach the area in which he was last seen. Each route involves navigating winding dirt roads and making a series of turns that one would consider unlikely without a final destination in mind. Why Haru was in Arizona on this day is unknown. He hadn't shared any plans to travel and had no known ties to anyone in any part of Arizona. What led him down the series of dirt roads he would travel that day in the area in which he was last seen is a complete mystery. His Twitter is full of tweets urging people to call him to learn how they can trade with the pros using his Forex magic stick. His LinkedIn shows no experience at all, but 14 years as a CEO global Forex trader. His family reported him missing when he didn't show up for work, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Brianna Wells was born March 25, 1997, and adopted by Dave and Rochelle at the age of seven. After her parents later divorced, Brianna mostly lived with her father and attended Marcos Deniza High School in Tempe, Arizona, where she ran track. She was also a member of the Tempe Monthly Meeting, which is a Quaker community fellowship. She enjoyed hanging out at local parks, but mostly the Kiwanis Park. She really loved animals, especially horses and her dogs, and dreamed of becoming a canine police officer. She even volunteered at an animal shelter and helped feed the homeless. She was described as very funny and sweet with a warm heart. However, she was also described as having violent outbursts towards her parents. At 9.30 a.m. on December 29, 2014, the 17-year-old's body was discovered by someone taking out their trash in an alley near Mobile Lane in 18th Place in South Phoenix. Police say Brianna had been beaten and shot multiple times, and they believe her body was dumped in the crime-ridden neighborhood. Her father said Brianna was home the night before when he went to bed. Although Brianna did have a troubled childhood and had run away many times, she always returned. According to an online post by her father, she had been at Willow Springs Mental Health Facility in Reno, Nevada because she wasn't stable enough at home. She had been in and out of several institutional settings due to her suicidal ideations. She was also refusing to take her meds or go to therapy. He said that on December 26, she left home and did not return for two whole days. When she did return, she described being at a place possibly South Phoenix where there had been gunfire. He said when he woke the next morning, he learned that she had left again in the middle of the night and left him a note. 
He said the contents of the note were pleasant in some ways, but very disturbing in others. He became concerned, but she did not have a working cell phone, and so he had no way to reach her. Soon after, he found out the horrible news. Police interviewed neighbors, searched for clues, and followed up on countless leads, but the killer has never been found. As of today, Brianna's murder still remains a mystery, and this case remains unsolved. James Hendrickson was born May 15, 1979, and was nicknamed Jimmy. In 1991, he was 12 years old, lived in the 200 block of East Delano Street in Tucson, Arizona, and was scheduled to enter the 6th grade at Amphi Middle School in the fall. In June of that year, his mother Deborah and 17-year-old sister Tammy went to Douglas, Arizona to meet the family of Tammy's boyfriend, but Jimmy chose not to go, so he was left to stay with a babysitter instead. Jimmy and the babysitter Angelica, who was also a friend of the family, went to a football game that night and a barbecue with Angelica's four-year-old nephew named Justin. Angelica then let the boys go with her cousin to stay the night at her sister's house near Prince and Stone Avenue in the 700 block of West Paris Promenade of Tucson. The cousin was a middle-aged man that had a warrant at the time for a sexual deviancy allegation. Jimmy stayed the night playing video games with the four-year-old boy. When his mother and sister returned to town several days later, they stopped at a store to use the payphone to call his mom's work to let them know they had just made it in a little late due to car trouble and she would be into work the next day. Her boss then told her that Jimmy was missing and was surprised that she didn't already know. The two then rushed to the police department. They were told that on the morning of June 12th, Jimmy said that he was walking home, which was about a mile away. However, witnesses reported seeing him about 8 o'clock that same night, walking near a Circle K convenience store in the vicinity of West Grant and North Oracle Roads. The man he was staying the night with was given a polygraph exam and failed. He is a suspect in the disappearance, but his name has never been publicly released and he has not faced any charges in the case. Jimmy did not have a history of running away from home, but he was considered a streetwise boy, and the police initially believed he was a runaway and not missing. His sister said that it wasn't until much later that the investigation determined foul play may have been involved. Jimmy's father lived in Michigan at the time of his disappearance and had not been in contact with his son for several years before he went missing. The four-year-old, who was with James before he disappeared, told police he knew where Jimmy was. He said two bad men had come in, wrapped him in a blanket, and took him away to Mexico. The boy led them to the Santa Cruz River adjacent to a local sports park and said that was where Mexico was, but a search of the area turned up nothing. 25 years after his disappearance, his sister Tammy requested a copy of her brother's missing persons file, which was an inch thick. After painstakingly going through the stack of reports, she realized that her brother was not just missing, but that something bad had happened to him. Despite all this, no one has been charged with his disappearance, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Cookie Sharon Jacobson was born September 16, 1949, and lived in Tempe, Arizona. In 1998, she was a 49-year-old former nurse with a 16-year-old son named Aaron and a 13-year-old daughter named Laura. Cookie had suffered a back injury in a car accident in the past and had to retire from nursing but started taking night classes in graphic art and computer at a local community college. She lived with her husband and two children near McClintock Drive and Southern Avenue in Tempe. On September 21, 1998, her husband Bill says he kissed her goodbye at 7 a.m. and headed to work. That evening, her husband found out she did not attend her night class, nor did she answer the door when a friend came to pick her up, and immediately he became very concerned. It is unclear if her husband was working out of town at this time or not, but he did report her missing the next day, and all of her personal belongings were found in the home. Her children stated that they last saw her when they left for school as she scolded them for being late. Ten days after her disappearance, her son Aaron told police that he had found her dead in bed and his sister Laura helped him dispose of her body because they were scared that they would be blamed for killing her. 
He said he wrapped her body in a yellow bed sheet and placed it in a trash can behind their house. Cookie's blood was found in the trash can, but there wasn't enough blood to prove she had died. Apparently, her body lay in the garbage can behind her home the entire time the children were telling police they had no idea where she was. One of Aaron's friends later stated that Aaron and Laura had wanted to kill their mother. Friends of Aaron's told police that he had bragged about having tried to kill his mother the year before by poisoning her and by cutting the brake lines on her car. Aaron was arrested for second-degree murder and Laura for allegedly helping him, but the two were quickly released hours later due to lack of evidence and were not charged with any crime. Her husband passed the lie detector test about whether he knew where his wife was or what happened to her. Aaron, however, failed his lie detector test and Laura's test was inconclusive. Despite all of this, the family's lawyer described the children as really good kids. Workers at the Butterfield Landfill in Mobile, Arizona, zoned off an area where they estimated the body would be. This field was roughly 70 feet long, 50 feet wide, and 13 feet deep. After specialized training, 18 Tempe police officers spent 59 days picking through 8,000 tons of waste. The city of Tempe spent $375,000 on searching the landfill. However, Cookie's body was never found, which is apparently the only reason the children have never been charged. Cookie's children remain the prime suspects in her presumed homicide. Aaron and Laura did not have a good relationship with their mother before her disappearance, although there were no reports of domestic violence. Since her disappearance, they have both left the Tempe area. Laura has always denied any involvement with her mother's disappearance. Investigators announced that they received a tip vital to the case in May 2003, but they did not release any details about what they had been told, and as of today, this case remains unsolved.